Hey everybody, this is Andy, aka Love Retro BTW, across Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch. I do a podcast every Saturday called Cafe BTW, a morning gaming podcast, a retrospective look at the wonderful world of retro gaming, from interviews to guests. Join us every Saturday, like a Saturday morning cartoon, starting at 8 a.m., 11 a.m. Eastern. Also, if you're on Twitter, please join the brand new retro gaming community, a place to share, connect, and show your love for the retro gaming community. All the links are down below. And remember, enjoy the Gamers Week podcast. Coming up on Gamers Week podcast. If they said that I have the voice to bring this character to life. <laughs> Hang on, Donnie. I'm going to look up a, a Bayonetta line and you can read it for us. Oh, oh yes. yes. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> I was hoping. So look in the Zencaster chat. If you need to learn how to talk to a lady, <laughs> ask your mum. <laughs> oh, my uh, God. Thank you, Mr. Griggs. I think we'll be going in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call us. We'll call you. Wow, a Grease reference. Good for you, sir. <laughs> I think that might be one of the best undercover jokes in a movie ever. If you can't be an athlete, be an athletic supporter. Look <laughs> at her face as she realizes what she said. <laughs> as a kid, I had had my dad translate that for me. I was like, why is that really right? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> it's like, because athletic support is a jock strap. I was like, ah. <laughs> You'll get it someday, son. In your defense, it's not like it's ever called that. Right. I, and I was also fairly young. I was probably nine, ten years old. So mm, Not yet in need of one? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still the case, but hey. Who's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> up? All right. Do we have enough to start this? <laughs> I think we do. Welcome to the Gamers Week podcast. Like the name says, we analyze the best, worst, and weirdest headlines of the past week in the video game industry. This is episode 44. Today is Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. And my name is Ryan, aka Retro Game Brews, and I have two fantastic people with me today. First up is a gentleman whose singing voice has been described by many as a mixture between Stevie Wonder, Billy Idol, and a hint of William Hung. Donnie G. Retro. How you doing, Donnie? <laughs> Uh, she definitely, she bang, she bang, she bang. Wow, that's a name I haven't heard in, I don't know, 10 years? Something like that? I'm all about the deep cuts. <laughs> well done. And I also have with me a woman whose thighs were recently burning with the fires of Mount Doom, Blue Williams. Blue, how are you doing today? I started CrossFit this week, okay? Don't get any weird ideas. <laughs> More context. <laughs> Purposefully obscure introductions. I'm sure when people are going to hear that, they're going to spit out whatever drink they have in their mouths. Like, what do you say? <laughs> I'm super sore. I can barely move from CrossFit. Just so everyone is clear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we jump into our reviews, reactions, and requests, why don't we do a quick couple of shout outs before we get started? So last week, three of us were guests on the Power Hour podcast with Jim and Brian of Drink a Beer and Play a Game. There was much drinking and shenanigans. So if you haven't checked out the show, uh, we'll be leaving some links in the episode notes so you can watch it for yourself. And... You get to see Blue actually moving. <laughs> what, you don't want to make a, a weird out of context, hey, we got you on film comment again? Since this seems to be the thing that you're doing lately. Well, the, I thought the thighs was just like, you know, that was that was a little much. So I didn't want to just pile on top of that. Well, but. I appreciate that. That's very thoughtful of you. You get to see Blue on film. What? Wait, what? <laughs> I give up. <laughs> see at least somebody else did it this time <laughs> <laughs> 
The past weekend was the Portrait Retro Gaming Expo, and our very own Donnie G was in attendance. He gives a full recap of his weekend in our most recent Gamers Week Uncut episode. So if you want to hear all about it, join us on patreon.com slash gamersweek podcast. Check it out. And speaking of PRGE, we want to congratulate Red Ox and Ducks in Disguise on producing a killer show during the Blockbuster Video World Championships 3. If you couldn't watch the broadcast lives, you can still catch the streams at twitch.tv slash retro gaming expo. Also, big congratulations to one of our patrons, Mega Retro Man, for placing third in the tournament. Yay! Woo! Woo! And there was no Game Genie. I have heard this from reliable sources. So great job. <laughs> uh, I was there. He had something underneath his controller, but I'm not going to start. It was a gummy substance. Was it a gummy substance? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> nice. All right, so let's jump into our reviews, reactions, and requests. So from Main Street Electrical Arcade, so my next door neighbor had the Sega Activator. It was definitely exhausting and not good. <laughs> <laughs> next up from You Fall Before Me, calling out Professor Rybred. Uh <laughs> Uh, I have an actually for Professor Rybread. Wasn't the iToy first released for the PlayStation 2 in the early 2000s? I love your gaming history segment. However, Donnie's comment really got me thinking. I have so many questions now. He is 100% correct. So obviously I do a lot of research for these and I spend a lot of time kind of, you know, referencing things back and forth. But the unfortunate part is that it's not always easy to get everything in uh, within a week. So I missed it. I messed up. You were right. And uh I will try to do better. <laughs> but that's okay because Ryan has in the past run a game on our patron only Discord called Pedantics Challenge, where this sort of thing is heavily encouraged. That's how you win the game. Indeed. So yep. he loves it when you um actually him. It's true. It's true. I really do. <laughs> And last up from Sanity Crypto. Yes, the Quest Pro is for the new world of work for the virtual realm, not for gamers. That being said, I want one. The graphics are fine on the Quest 2 and the Rift right now. But if you get close to text in a game, it gets blurry as The Pro claims you'll be able to have crisp and clear readability on fine prints. However, I don't know any company in the world that's going to jump on this train willingly other than Meta itself. Just put on your readers in the virtual world and you'll be fine. <laughs> exactly. That's kind of what I was thinking is. You really want to spend $1,500 just to be able to read fine text in a video game? <laughs> I love you, Sanity, but that doesn't seem quite worth it to me. It has to be super realistic. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and now it's time for the... Very important poll. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> we'll see how that turns out of the show. You're not going to tell us what that was? What, what do you mean? It was a voice. Yeah, but what was the noise at the end? Oh, just like a giggle. That was a giggle? <laughs> that was... <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> Was that better? Not no, even a little. <laughs> <laughs> no, shut it down. <laughs> Cut it out. Mm-hmm. Every Monday on Twitter, we post our VIP, our very important poll. If you'd like to participate, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. So the question for this past week was, who is your favorite senior citizen, 65 plus years old, video game character? Coming in at number three. Bayonetta, 14.5%. Kratos sliding in the second spot with 25.2%. And taking the honors this week, good old Scrooge McDuck at 42.7%. We did get 17.5% in the other category. So let's take a look at some of the comments from the poll. At Mad Maverick Toy says, Rena Lansford from Star Ocean, 1.4 million years old. Holy crap. At Oya Bungaijin says, God in Actraiser. Infinite years old. At Digit Hack says Alucard is 566 plus years old. I wonder if he goes in for dinner at four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Only because you get the coupon. Only because, yes, yes, you get the coupon. I'm going to butcher this, so please forgive me. Uh, at Baku Eels says Shio Garath, the epitome of an eccentric old timer, if also a psychopath. 
And at Mr. Underscore Univac says, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. I can't believe the poll did not include the original gaming old man. How dare we? Right, right. I mean, he's not wrong. But we don't know if he's over 65. I mean, there's no definitive evidence for that. Maybe he just, uh, he went he went gray and white early. Right. Back in that time frame, he could be like 30 years old. Because <laughs> that's old to most teenagers nowadays. Oh. <laughs> so with this week's poll question, Blue, what was your choice? So I do want to point out, Donnie didn't say it, but the poll includes the information that Scrooge McDuck is 120 plus years old. Mm-hmm. I had never heard that. Like that blew my mind when Ryan put out this poll question. I was like, are you freaking serious? 120 plus years old, Scrooge McDuck. And he's still so spry and (laughs) everything going around the world and bouncing on his cane as a pogo stick. I was just thinking about that. Do we have a definitive answer what duck years are? Like how dog years are seven years? That was my next question. I was like, what (laughs) is the typical lifespan of ducks? Because I'm so impressed. Let's ask our friend ducks in disguise. He might know. (laughs) <laughs> Good call. We also can ask ducks with thick thighs as well. Yes, we, <laughs> yeah. have, we have a, a plethora of uh, waterfowl who are patrons of the podcast. Right. So um, I thought about this for a long time. Scrooge McDuck was a very tempting choice because not only do I love that game, I'll, I grew up on the cartoons. They're some of my favorites. So very tempting choice. But in the end, actually, uh, I wanted to go with something a little bit different. I picked Dracula from the Castlevania games. Depending on which wiki you read, he's several hundred to maybe even a thousand or so years old. But is the villain of the series that I love very much. I'm going for Dracula. I think that's a good choice. Excellent choice. Yeah, I think so too. Just uh, Dracula keep running into the the Belmonts like another one. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Belmont twice removed uh, roommate. Like, oh, Jesus, can we just get this over with? Yeah. It's like like the uh, architect from the Matrix. Like, I've seen several of your kind before. (laughs) (laughs) You must be the Belmont. Uh, So I'm going to go with um, one of my favorite characters to voice, which is Deckard Cain, of course, from Ah. Diablo. Yeah. So I told you about the (laughs) Haradro. Deckard Cain is awesome. He's a cool dude. He helps you out. He basically he's like the narrator of that game for for the most part. He follows along with you, you know, and so huge props to Deckard sticking it around, even though he knows that Diablo is coming. He knows that his town has been raised by the powers of Diablo, but he's still sticking with it. You know, he's not he's not going into retirement. So I got to appreciate that. Somebody with a with a strong work ethic. So what you're saying is he's not a little. (laughs) (laughs) I told you I'm not a little. (laughs) I mean, you know what happens to him in the in Diablo three, though, right? No, I haven't got that far. (laughs) He dies. Tell me he dies. Uh, spoilers. Oh, don't tell me he died. You just no. said, tell I me he died. I said nothing. I said nothing. <laughs> I said nothing. It was a mixture of emotions. Okay. I wanted to know that I didn't want to know. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Donnie? Oh, uh, I, I think my, my initial reaction was to go with Scrooge McDuck. Uh, he was the first one that I thought of. When I think of Kratos, I don't think of somebody who's 150 years old. He definitely doesn't look like a senior citizen. Um, he's like one of these jacked older men that's constantly hitting the gym. He looks like he's like maybe 50, but in all reality, he's 95 and he's still got the... Uh, I mean, he looks good for 50. Yes, he does. <laughs> Um, there, there really wasn't a lot of older people that I could think of, um, except for one of my favorite characters of all time, Solid Snake. And uh. in Metal Gear Solid 4, <sighs> Snake is an old man. I, I don't remember the specifics, but I know that Snake has aged quite terribly. And I think it's because of the nano machines or something like that inside of mm-hmm. him that it caused him to age uh, very rapidly. So his life is coming to an end, and but he's still got it. He's still able to move around very spryly, uh, crouch down in the cardboard box and sneak around and shoot people with a tranquilizer dart, all that stuff. He still got it. Um, so he was, he was my choice for this week. I was just thinking like if at his age, you know, Glad that he's still spry because it, it would be really difficult to do a stealth game with a walker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an, an accurate stealth game where you, right. you're moving like at about one mile an hour. <laughs> 
or you have to crouch down to get behind something and then you can't get back up. And you can't get back up. <laughs> or if he lays down in the prone and he just falls asleep. <laughs> you, know, you, you hear something like you see the Z's coming up above his head and he starts snoring and that alerts the guards. Then you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. That probably wouldn't sell too many copies. <laughs> no. <laughs> Instead of a cigarette, it's a pack of Centrum Silver. <laughs> <laughs> Or it's uh, what were there's original? original yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and jump into our patron shout outs for the week? We couldn't do what we do without the help of our gorgeous patrons. Here are the generous folks supporting Gamers Week on Patreon Mega Retro Man, Gamma Troid, Emo Esque. Bill Tucker, Rye Bread's number one fan, Fruitcake's number one stan, Ducks with Thick Thighs, The Wizard of Zardoz, Clayman 71, Great Sayaman 81, BNT Zilla Guy, Geek With That, Crunchy Kong, Sheriff Snacks, Frank Grande, JNL Game, Love Retro BTW, Steven Sand, Ramboski, Terry Kinnear, Ducks in Disguise, Jim and Colleen, Games with Coffee, Davey PGH, The Red Ox, PDX Family, including Shannon and Luke, Zach Huge Thanks, Random Retro Dude, Princess Kitty Mew Mew, and Rai Rai's Secret Best Friend. If you like what you hear today, and we really hope you do, please consider joining us on Patreon. Your support helps cover the cost of producing the show, as well as other cool stuff we'll be doing, like prizes and giveaways. You'll also gain access to our weekly patron-only bonus cast called Gamers Week Uncut, Patrons with Benefits. Visit patreon.com slash gamersweek or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. I'm not reading that. <laughs> Foiled again. What he wants me to say is no curses this week because I hate fun. <laughs> and you know, you keep telling me that and it doesn't hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm not going to, to try to hurt your feelings. Just being truthful. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we jump into our headlines for the week? Our headline segment is proudly sponsored by the Retro Game Club podcast. It's a fantastic family friendly retro gaming podcast. In each episode, Rob and Hugh pick two games to play and discuss as well as news, interviews and other topics. Right now, they're talking about Virtual Warzone, a brand new game released for the Virtual Boy. Yes, you heard that right. Visit them at RetroGameClub.net to follow the link in the show notes. Say what? Say what? This is the kind of stuff that I like to see. New games coming out for older systems. Right. Right, but the amount of copies that you're going to sell of that? Eh. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many people actually have a virtual boy. I have two, but I'm just not flexing. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you going to buy two copies of this and support the developers? You know what I do, man? Two copies of virtual boy. <laughs> Same time. Same time yeah. <laughs> From IGN, Silent Hill Transmission, everything announced in the showcase. As part of today's Silent Hill Transmission, Konami announced multiple Silent Hill games and projects. As rumored, Bloober Team is developing a full remake of Silent Hill 2 with the help of original team silent artist Masahiro Ito and composer Akira Yamaoka. The remake was announced for PlayStation 5 and will retell the story of James Sunderland as he searches for his dead wife after receiving a mysterious letter from her from the town of Silent Hill. Konami and Bloober are promising a fully reworked game using new technology and delivered in 4K. Silent Hill Townfall is a new spinoff developed by No Code Studios, Stories Untold, and publisher Annapurna Interactive. This new project will be a unique take on the Silent Hill franchise from a highly decorated AA developer. Another new spinoff announced is Silent Hill F. Set in 1960s Japan, this narrative-driven spinoff will be written by acclaimed Japanese writer Ryukishi 07, who created visual novels like Higurasha and Umi Nikyo. The spinoff will juxtapose a beautiful and terrifying world and focus on the psychological, supernatural mysteries of Silent Hill. Potentially the most unique announcement from the transmission is Silent Hill Ascension, an immersive project where participants around the world will control the characters in a new Silent Hill story. Basically a Let's Play Pokemon version of a new Silent Hill story that will be live on multiple platforms. Silent Hill Ascension is a collaboration between Genvid Entertainment Bad Robot Games, Behavior Interactive, and DJ2 Entertainment, 
Behavior Interactive. Isn't that the same company that does Dead by Daylight? It is. Oh. <laughs> Christoph Gans, the director of the first Silent Hill movie, is making a third movie in the series with Return to Silent Hill. Details are being kept under wraps for now, but Konami is promising more information about the project at a later date. So did you guys see the transmission today? I did see the transmission. Mm, okay. It was a very good transmission. There have been Silent Hill rumors floating around on the internet for years, and the series has not seen a game since 2012, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we've talked before about how Konami, it seems like they've been completely ignoring and neglecting Silent Hill, where they even let their ownership of the website lapse so that a fan had to go buy it up. Right. And so this, when they announced this transmission, it was like, oh my God, are we finally going to get confirmation of all the things we've been hoping for. And of right. course, every Silent Hill fan had this fear deep in the back of their mind, like they were just going to come up and announce NFTs and pachinko machines. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we were all about ready to throw ourselves off the roof as if that happened, but it didn't. We actually got some interesting looking stuff. Now, they opened the transmission with this Silent Hill 2 remake, which I don't think was a great idea because mm -hmm. that had already leaked. So right, right. They, they opened it with that trailer and then they spent about 20 minutes talking about it. And so it seemed like there wasn't going to be anything else. And I think a right. lot of people turned it off. I did. And then Emo in our Discord was like, did anybody check on Writer's View? Did she keep watching? And I was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> He's like, you've got to turn it back on because there's a lot more stuff. I was like, oh, crap. Okay. But for the Silent Hill 2 remake in particular, this phrase at the end, Konami and Bluebird are promising a fully reworked game. Mm -hmm. It makes me a little nervous. What does reworked mean? How many changes are they going to make? Uh, that's a good question. Now, the trailer, Konami was really smart with this trailer because it has so many iconic shots from the original game redone in this new engine. Right. They've got uh, that first glimpse of Pyramid Head. They've got James looking at himself in the mirror. Like all these iconic moments from the game are included in the trailer. I'm sure they're aware that fans are really, really nervous about this remake because Silent Hill 2 is considered by many to be the peak of the Silent Hill series right. and to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest horror game of all time. So this remake has big shoes to fill mm -hmm. and I am nervous about it as well but at least as far as the trailer went looks okay so far yeah I think that seeing what they've done to Final Fantasy 7 I think is what puts everybody on on edge right, <laughs> right? <laughs> but to your point this game is so well revered that yes I can see there being a positive thing about maybe reworking it and making it even scarier than it was the first time around but deviating too much from the the, the, the main story I think would be a mistake and I, I don't see that happening if you if you look at what's happened with Resident Evil 2 the Resident Evil 2 remake that really stuck to the story as much as possible and we got to see better environments um right, right. The, the sound the ambiance, Everything there in, in, in high definition made me want to crap myself. If you take that <laughs> and put it into Silent Hill, which is a hundred times scarier, then I think it's going to be a home run. I, I, I'd be hard pressed to say that they're going to deviate from the original storyline or, or anything like that. But they're just going to be because the technology is so much better now. I think they're going to be able to deliver the experience that it was meant to be with this remake. So you're thinking more like quality of life stuff. I hope so. I really hope so. I kind of don't really remember Silent Hill 2. I remember owning it and playing it um, along with Silent Hill 1. But as far as the specifics, I know that that's the first time we got to see Pyramid Head. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. In Silent Hill 2? Okay. So I, like I said, I don't remember much of it. I'm excited to go back and kind of revisit it and see if anything sparks my memory. The problem is it's a timed exclusive on the PS5. So that means PS5 owners will be getting it first. Blue is probably jumping up and down right now and squeeing as she should. I was talking to Davey today and, and he's like, 
you're, you're not going to do it, are you? I'm like, ah, I don't know. He's like, dude, you, you sat there and complained about getting a PS5. You don't want to get a PS5, but now you're thinking about getting a PS5? I was like, well, it's for Silent Hill 2. <laughs> what, uh, out of all of these announcements, which one were you most excited to hear about or excited to see, Ryan? Uh, so I like the Silent Hill F. Uh, it looked really, really creepy. Uh, not having a whole lot of experience with the Silent Hill franchise itself, it would mm-hmm. be cool to kind of get into this and play it. Uh, I will say, though, with the trailer, it reminded me of Dumb and Dumber, where what? it was, <clears throat> our characters' faces are falling oh, off! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, at the very end, that was kind of creepy. You just see the, the, yep. the character sitting there, and all of a sudden, the face just slides down like a piece of baloney off of a wall. <laughs> the one thing that that creeped me out about it so i'm i'm not terribly claustrophobic but i'm mildly claustrophobic and the idea of all those like tendrils coming in and consuming you mm-hmm. that creeped me out also there is there's a particular phobia and i don't remember the name of it but it's like a phobia of uh small holes you know in objects <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and and that also creeps me out. So there, there's a lot of creep in this game for me, uh, which I'm okay with. I'm willing to let that be that experience because there's an adrenaline rush that comes from that kind of stuff. So I think I'd be interested in that. Blue, what was your favorite? Uh, well, I think Silent Hill F does look interesting. I would like to know more about it. Silent Hill Townfall, I'm excited about because it's a – Another new story and the little teaser that they gave us showed very little about it. You were just kind of looking at a radio that was Mm -hmm. saying some dialogue. But I don't know. I got excited when I saw it. I was like, this could be good because, you know, as great as Silent Hill 2 is, the remake will be welcomed by many, but we know the story. So I'm excited for new stories in Silent Hill that hopefully return the series to its golden years as opposed to what it became with its later several entries. Right, right. May not happen. They may <laughs> fall completely, fail completely, but uh, fingers crossed, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's just a wait and see now. Mm-hmm. What I like about this, though, is that they've come out with so many IPs for Silent Hill this time around. It Probably one of them is going to at least you know, scratch yeah. that itch that you're looking for. At least one of them has to be okay, right? Right. Yeah. right? Just the odds okay. are in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'll take it. So Donnie, what about you? What are you looking most forward to? Um, the thing I'm kind of excited for, and I think I'm going to be in the minority here, is the new Silent Hill movie. Uh. I really <laughs> liked the first one. The second one, not so much. It got a little weird, but I don't know. I like. I, I really hope that the third one comes back and kind of makes up for it. Right. I really don't know what's going on with this um, Let's Play Pokemon version of Silent Hill. Like, live on multiple platforms, yep. it's going to be an immersive project where everybody around the world will control the characters in a store. I, I don't know how that's going to work. Co-op Silent Hill? Uh... Maybe. To me, it feels like it would turn it into like an action experience. Right, right. As opposed to like the slow psychological horror that Silent Hill is known for. There's also part of me that wonders how many trolls are going to get on there to try to manipulate the... Ruin the story on purpose. Of course. Of course. And they will. So depending on how many people you have to play with at one time, and then how much longevity you can get out of the story based on your decisions, I don't know. If I had to pick one to fail, this is the one I would pick. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm a huge fan of decisions that you make in a game affect the, the later part of a game. And that's why I love Chrono Trigger. But I want to be the only person making those choices. <laughs> right. So at the end of the day, that's not what I'm looking for. It's the like exact opposite, essentially. Right. You can live with your consequences, but not with somebody else's or millions exactly. of other people. Yeah. Some idiot on the team bringing everybody down. I mean, come on. Silent <laughs> yeah. Hill should not be a team sport. I think it's still exciting, though, the fact that they're they listen to fans and they, they're finally coming out with this stuff. I mean, after all of all of the hype that's that's gone there, it's uh, the thirst has been quenched, I think, for now. And exciting to kind of see what it's going to look like moving over the next couple of years. 
And just hoping none of these are, uh, you know, mobile games in disguise. Uh, Well, that will be so relevant here in a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Next up from Game Rant. Rocksteady developer thinks Xbox Series S is going to hold back this entire generation of games. A senior developer at Rocksteady Studios shared on Twitter that he believes the Xbox Series S console has hamstrung an entire generation of video games. A conversation has started online following news that Gotham Knights will launch only supporting 30 FPS on consoles, despite being exclusive to PS5 and Xbox Series X. This has prompted some to make strong statements regarding why some games may be constrained and making the Xbox Series S a prime target. In a series of tweets, Rocksteady senior character technical artist Lee Devonald joined the conversation regarding Gotham Knights. He says that there's, quote, an entire generation of games hamstrung by that potato. He explains that Microsoft won't let you launch on one, the Series X, without the other, the Series S. It's this requirement, paired with the Xbox Series S's comparably less powerful GPU, that explains why Devonald believes the generation is hamstrung. Twitter users pointed out that Devonald's call for respect for developers is hypocritical if he's doing so while attacking Microsoft's Xbox Series S developers in the same breath. And to Devonald's credit, he has since apologized for his post regarding the Xbox Series S. He says that he wanted to educate regarding some of the trials that occur in development and that development teams should always be free to make their game their way. Further, he reiterates that any level of developer abuse or harassment is wrong and needs to stop, something that everyone should be able to agree with. (laughs) Respect the devs, but whoever developed the Xbox Series S, screw you. (laughs) (laughs) I just love that they refer to it as that potato. That potato. That's why I emphasize, quote, that potato. (laughs) It does seem kind of silly to be playing it on a PS5 and have 30 FPS like this is not why I spent $600. Right. No. But I think it's an interesting wrinkle to the console wars that we've been talking about the, the past few weeks, right? Because we've been talking about the commoditization of games largely as being Xbox's approach. Right. Both Sony and Microsoft have a, a version of their console that takes discs and another one that is digital only. So the Xbox Series S is $300, while the PS5 Digital Edition is $400. So by giving it a less powerful GPU, Microsoft was able to drop the cost of the console by $100. Mm -hmm. Makes it a lot more accessible to a lot more people at that price point. However, now we are seeing that it doesn't come without consequences. So if you're the kind of person who can't bear to play a game at 30 FPS, maybe... Sony is your way to go because they're not compromising on performance with their consoles the way Microsoft is. Does that mean that the PS5 version will run at 60 frames per second? No, no version of this particular game will run at oh, 60 and, and frames per second. That's right. why people are pissed off. Is this because of the Xbox S? Because they developed it for that system and because of the limitations on it, yeah, it was developed to run at the lowest common denominator, right. basically. Oh, uh, then uh, I'm sorry. I think you're going to run into a lot of people who don't want to experience that because just like you said, you spent $600 on a brand new system. It is the new gen system. And I want to play new gen games that look 4K, 8K, whatever. Yeah, we want all the bright and shiny. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm sorry if the Xbox Series S if you're a potato, then yeah. I mean, he's definitely right. It's it's hamstringing everybody else that wants to play this game in full 60 frames per second glory. And if they wanted to say, okay, you know what? We'll, we'll open this up and we'll say, we no longer require you to re- program for both the S and the X at the same time. Everybody who bought an S is going to be like, what the f-? You know, I can't right. play these games now. So they've put themselves in a pretty precarious situation there. I think it's a huge win in the PlayStation column because you know that the first party Sony games are not going to be making these kinds of compromises. They're always going to look great. Yep. Hey, an extreme lack of potato <laughs> No <laughs> potatoes. So the Xbox Series S came out, like you said, 2019, 2020? 2020. 2020. Okay. So two years. 
Sounds like it's kind of outgrown itself already. It has. And that's that's a shame for the people who, who were only able to afford an Xbox Series S, thinking that would, they would get all of these games that you know the, the Xbox Series X has, the PS5 has, and it's going to look just as great. Hold on. Pump the brakes, son. Sorry, you chose the console that's got a little less of a processor in it. And Sorry. Well, and it gives you almost no reason, I think, to go get the Series X, the more expensive console, if the games are going to look the same as on the S. Yeah, you're absolutely right. right. Yeah. So. Could you have a external GPU? Say Microsoft says, you know what, you're absolutely right. We, we screwed up. This GPU is just not going to be a good fit for it. Is there any way for them to create like a add-on or something you could buy as a peripheral that would act as the GPU rather than the, the one that's in the system? I don't believe so, uh, yeah, simply because so. the only way that you're connecting it is with, via um, USB. Yeah. Because the internal, yeah. you've got the, um, the PCI, PCI Express, those ports. Yep. They transfer data um, at a different rate than the uh, the USB does. So I really couldn't tell you, but it, it just doesn't sound plausible. A much easier fix is to require developers to include a performance mode with every mm. game so that if you choose to, you can play the higher resolution version of the game. Now, of course, that puts an enormous burden on developers. Right. Mm-hmm. But I doubt very much that Microsoft cares about that. <laughs> Well, they will when they, people stop developing for the Xbox. But they're not going to. I mean, just because of margins, more or less. I it's, mean, it's, you know what happens if your game is not on the Xbox, not on Game Pass, you know? Right, right. Imagine, like, have you seen on Twitter all the people complaining that the new Silent Hill 2 remake is not going on Xbox? Yes, I did. They ain't happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up from Eurogamer. There's a new Mortal Kombat role-playing game coming. But <laughs> Warner Brothers has announced a new role-playing Mortal Kombat game for mobile. Developed by <laughs> <laughs> developed by NetherRealm Studios and known as Mortal Kombat Onslaught, this game will make its debut in 2023 and provide users with their first mobile exclusive cinematic story experience for the series. On its release next year, players will be tasked with building up their team of fighters, of which there will be a vast roster of characters to pick from, in a bid to stop a dark and dangerous threat from wreaking havoc across the realms. This will all be done via real-time group battles. NetherRealm's Ed Boon wrote in a press release, the team is pushing the boundaries of Mortal Kombat with its upcoming release, stating the goal is to allow players to experience the franchise in new ways, while still staying true to its core visceral nature. Boone continued, with Mortal Kombat Onslaught, we reimagined Mortal Kombat into a strategic team-based collection RPG with fast-paced group melee combat that both new and existing fans can enjoy. Those keen to hear more about Mortal Kombat's latest foray into the mobile market can sign up for updates via onslaught.mortalkombat.com. I'm sure gamers all know this, but if you don't, Mortal Kombat is spelled with a K. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I think the group who doesn't know that it's spelled with a K is probably the only people who would enjoy this game. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I've been typing this in this web address. It's just not working. (laughs) Or Ed Boon. Existing fans could not enjoy this piece of crap. I just don't see taking Mortal Kombat into a brand new genre and the mobile platform being the the like hey you know what that's the that's the one we want to go with we're gonna we're gonna do this right i mean we know that developers love the quick money approach of mm-hmm. a mobile game but if you think about mortal Kombat, has a very long history as a fighting game as one of the premier fighting mm-hmm. game franchises and people get super serious about this like anybody who has tried to go online and play Mortal Kombat knows you will get your ass handed to you (laughs) if you don't have all of those combos and the timing on lock and memorized and ready Mm -hmm. to go. So I can't imagine the fighting game community who fiercely loves these types of games to be content playing Mortal Kombat with touchscreen controls. Oh, yeah. Well, And it's not even that. It's not the fact that it's a fighting game on mobile with touchscreen. It's a it's a freaking RPG. <laughs> Are you serious? 
So like, how is it going to work? Are you going to be like, is it going to be turn based? Like now, Scorpion, go do your get over here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it says it's going to be done in via real time group battle. So are we talking Clash of Clans esque? No, I'm thinking it's more like an action RPG. uh, If I had to guess. I don't know. I no. I mean, I, I like Mortal Kombat for the um, the competitiveness of, of fighting somebody, um, a stranger or a friend or what have you, and kicking their butt. But a real time group battle, like get like forcing me to play with multiple people and getting in a group and all. Eh, no, don't, mm-hmm. no. And it says it's a strategic team based collection RPG. Code microtransactions. Right, right. <laughs> the, they're saying to your wallet, get over here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you weak, pathetic fool. Yeah, but you, you don't have time to grind to build up your players? Ah, there's a microtransaction for that. Oh, your God. favorite character is not free to play? There's a microtransaction for that. Yep. I see this crashing and burning and probably being canceled well before a year after it's been out. It will go the way of Final Fantasy VII, The First Soldier. Yep. Just like nobody asked for a shooter, Battle Royale, Final Fantasy VII game. I'm not sure who out there is asking for a strategic team-based collection RPG of Mortal Kombat. (laughs) Donnie, what I'm going to do is put in my calendar a year from today. It's okay. Say, Donnie said <laughs> well, no, 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 no. It, it's it's debuting in 2023, so we have to find out right, right, right. The exact yeah. date it's going oh, to debut. Yeah. You have to at least yes. give him the year. Yeah, and then uh, you know, because we're still going to be podcasting until our, our 80s, so clearly we're still going to be around then. <laughs> um, if you get it right, I will buy you an awesome scorpion figure. Ooh, ooh, I, I'm a, okay. I can put that right next to my Shao Kahn figure. There it is. And you know what? I, I imagine Dottie's out there. It's like 11 months and he's trolling everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this game sucks. We should, we should cancel it. Hashtag cancel Mortal Kombat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Donnie's trying to get something canceled again. I mean, should Donnie be giving Ryan something if he's wrong? I th- That's I not the stipulation of the steel. I'm just saying because then Donnie has nothing to lose and Ryan only has something to lose. It doesn't seem very fair. It's that's the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> You're just gonna roll over and accept it. Giggity. He just lays over and takes it. <laughs> All right. So why don't we go into our top three new releases? All right. First up is a Plague Tale Requiem out on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, Switch, and PC. After escaping their devastated homeland, Amicia and Hugo attempt to start a new life and control Hugo's curse. But when Hugo's powers reawaken, death and destruction return in a flood of devouring rats. Forced to flee once more, the siblings place their hope on a prophesized island that may hold the key to saving Hugo. Discover the cost of saving those you love in a desperate struggle for survival. Strike from the shadows or unleash hell overcoming foes and challenges with a variety of weapons tools and unearthly powers gotham knights is out on the ps5 xbox series x and s and pc Batman is dead, and a new expansive criminal underworld has swept the streets of Gotham City. It is now up to the Batman family, Batgirl, Nightwing, Red Hood, and Robin to protect Gotham, bring hope to its citizens, discipline to its cops, and fear to its criminals. Gotham Knights is an open-world action RPG set in the most dynamic and interactive Gotham City yet. Patrol Gotham's five distinct boroughs in solo or in co-op, and drop in on criminal activity wherever you find it. And lastly, Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope out on the Switch. Team up with Mario, Luigi, Princess Peach, Rabbid Peach, Rabbid Luigi, and their friends on a galactic journey to defeat a malevolent entity. Explore planets throughout the galaxy as you uncover mysterious secrets and compelling quests. Build your dream team with three heroes from an eclectic roster of nine. Rescue the adorable sparks throughout the galaxy who provide distinct powers that will help you in battle. Unleash your hero's skills, but be strategic as you dash your enemies Team jump on your allies and hide behind covers. So out of these three, what are you looking at, Ryan? Uh, Gotham Knights is attractive to me because I'm a fan of Batman. But Batman's dead. <laughs> <laughs> right, but the, 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 the Batman universe. So I think it would be, a, it's an interesting take on this, just, you know, from a 
an action RPG perspective, you know, there, there have been a lot of really great Batman games. So I would imagine this is going to be more of the same. So that would be exciting. Uh, Plague Tale Requiem looks gorgeous uh, as far as the, the graphics are concerned. I don't know too much about that game. Uh, so probably I'd have to, to see and hear more before I would put my stamp of approval on that. And uh, Mario and Rabbids, I never got the Rabbids. I don't know why that's like a thing. <laughs> <laughs> That is off my radar 100%. So definitely not going with that. So out of these three, probably Gotham. Okay. What about you, Donnie? Uh, I'm leaning more towards Gotham Knights. I, I'm a big fan of the uh, Arkham series, Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Arkham Knight, etc. The only difference is that this is an action RPG, mm-hmm. whereas the other Arkham series is not an RPG in any way, shape, or form. So right. I'm kind of curious as to how this works here gameplay looks great but again 30 frames per second i don't know how that's going to look or feel um i I have high hopes but uh, we'll see a plague tale requiem looks amazing just like ryan said i don't know the story at all but from what i'm seeing it looks like it could be a lot of fun mario plus rabbits uh i I really can't make this game out. I don't know what type of game it is. Is it a platformer? Is it a strategy game? It's like a strategy RPG. Yeah, no, thank you. So either Gotham Knights or a Plague Trail Requiem. Okay. Blue, what's your choice this week? You know, I've heard great things about the first Mario plus Rabbids game, but I too am in that camp that I just don't understand the appeal of the Rabbids. They seem... (laughs) really annoying so while i think it might be a great game and full of a lot of that mario charm and nintendo attention to detail i cannot gotham knights no thank you uh plague tale (laughs) requiem i played the demo for the first plague tale and it does look amazing i think this is one of the examples of what double a studios can do when they really put their mind to it I probably should go back and finish the first one. Um, so of these three, I would be most likely to try Plague Tale Requiem. Do nice. you feel like it's a necessity to go back and play the first one or finish oh, it yes. in order to enjoy the second one? Okay. Y- yeah, you need the story. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just get the cliff notes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. Otherwise, you're going to be lost. <laughs> All right, so why don't we tackle our main topic for the week from Bloomberg. A tense pay dispute overshadows Nintendo's upcoming Bayonetta 3. A pay dispute between the creators of critically acclaimed video game series and its star voice actor reignited a long-simmering debate over wages in the industry. As is often the case in these sorts of disagreements, the details surrounding negotiations and casting for the upcoming game Bayonetta 3 are more complicated than what has been portrayed publicly. The feud spilled out into the open over the weekend when Helena Taylor, the star of the first two Bayonetta games, said she would not appear in the next iteration, set to be released on Nintendo Switch on October 28th. She posted a series of videos Saturday on Twitter accusing Nintendo Corporation and the game's developer Platinum Games of offering her a total of $4,000 to reprise her role. She said she rejected the lowball offer and asked fans to refrain from buying the game. If you're someone who cares about people, who cares about the world around you, who cares about who gets hurt with these financial decisions, then I urge you to boycott this game, Taylor said in one of her videos. The video went viral, racking up more than 9.5 million views on Twitter. Taylor's story touched a nerve among gamers. Voice actors are beloved by fans, but fail to command anywhere close to what a Hollywood actor makes. Game actors have long complained of being underpaid and underappreciated. In the case of Bayonetta 3, the developer appeared to be determined to rehire Taylor, according to two people familiar with the negotiations, as well as documentation reviewed by Bloomberg. Here's where their accounts differ. Platinum Games sought to hire Taylor for at least five sessions, each paying $3,000 to $4,000 for four hours in the studio, said the people, who asked not to be identified because they aren't authorized to discuss private contract negotiations. That would make the total for the game at least $15,000. In response, they said, Taylor asked for a six-figure sum as well as residuals on the game. Platinum declined and, following lengthy negotiations, took auditions for a new actor. 
Platinum later offered Taylor a cameo in the game for the fee of one session, which she turned down, the people said. In an email, Taylor described this account as an absolute lie and said Platinum was trying to save their ass in the game. She said she stood by everything she said in the video. I would like to put this whole bloody franchise behind me, quite frankly. Get on with my life in the theater. In the theater, she wrote. (laughs) Representatives for Platinum Games and Nintendo didn't respond to requests for comment. Hideki Kamiya, the executive director of Bayonetta 3, called Taylor's allegations sad and deplorable in a Twitter post. For Bayonetta 3, the acting costs were higher than other projects because the studio relied on union performances, said three people familiar with the game's production, which meant a minimum of about $900 for a four-hour voice session plus bonuses. Prominent actors or franchise stars like Taylor usually make more. In her videos, Taylor mentioned Jennifer Hale, the prolific voice actor who took over the role of Bayonetta in the new game. I wish her all the joy in the world. I wish her all the jobs, but she has no right to say she is the voice of Bayonetta, Taylor said. I created that voice. She has no right to sign merchandise as Bayonetta. Hale faced some vicious online harassment as a result. She wrote Monday on Twitter that she had signed a non-disclosure agreement and couldn't elaborate on the situation. I sincerely ask that everyone keep in mind that this game has been created by an entire team of hardworking, dedicated people, and I hope everyone will keep an eye open about what they've created, she wrote. A few hours later, she retweeted a Twitter thread from another voice actor saying, if you only hear one side or part of one side of a story, you haven't heard the whole story. Good Lord. Drama. This is ridiculous. Sounds like she's calling somebody out. So before we get into the meat of the argument between the voice actors, I want to say if you're a type of person who goes on Twitter and joins the Twitter mob against other people online, don't do that. Stop doing that. Please. Why are you going to bat for a celebrity that doesn't know who you are and doesn't care about you? Just don't do it. Just don't do it. And the the simple fact that somebody goes on Twitter or social media and, and tells their side of the story. They rally the troops. People are like, oh, I love this person. Oh, I, I think I have a shot with this person. Oh, if I do this, this person will notice me and I'll jump on the bandwagon. Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. And then the whole story comes out and you end up looking like a d- Right. <laughs> yeah. Even if you love their work, and that's something to keep in mind, separate the person from their work. You love their work, great. Doesn't mean you have to fawn at their feet and kiss their ass either. Right. But anyway, this is getting pretty messy. Yeah. But I will say from the outside, of course, like this says, you have to hear, take both sides of the story into account. From the outside, I will say that the person who looks really bad here is Helena Taylor. Right. How are you going to say, if you're someone who cares about people, who cares about the world around you, who cares about who gets hurt with these financial decisions, then I urge you to boycott this game. Most selfish thing I have ever heard. Because it's not just Taylor working on this game. She's acting like she's the only person who put any time and effort and work into Bayonetta. There are hundreds of people who have worked on this game, who count on these jobs and want this game to succeed. And just because she's butthurt about her contract negotiations, she's willing to throw all those other people under the bus so that she can win, so she can get her point across. I understand that the the plight of video game voice actors could be better, but if you want to make it better, this is not the way to go about it. And the, the follow up with the I wish all the joy in the world and I wish her all the jobs, but she can't be Bayonetta stuff. That catty. to me sounded so catty, so incredibly yep. catty. And that says to me that she does not have control of her emotions at the moment and she's using Twitter as an as a weapon, more or less. The the thing to remember is she didn't create the character of Bayonetta. Somebody Mm -hmm. else wrote that character for her. Somebody else wrote those lines for her. She performed them, which is important, but it is not her character. She was part of a team that created that character, but she is acting like she's the only one who matters. You're right. But she gave the character life, so to speak. You're breaking up, Donnie. Okay. It wasn't just me. You're breaking up with me? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I didn't want to tell you like this. Um, (laughs) So she she is... The person that gave the character life, so to speak, with her voice and and whatnot. And I can understand from her perspective when when you do that and you give a character life and all of a sudden somebody slides in because you're out and now they're voicing that character. If, you know, the same, if not better or, or what have you. But to say that that person can't claim that they are 
Bayonetta or a- anybody in particular, they're not that character. I, that's a little cringy. I mean, she says in one breath, I would love to forget this bloody franchise and focus on my career in the theater. <laughs> in the theater. Then do that. In the theater. Then, yeah, then do that. You should be more than happy that somebody else can take on the Bayonetta mantle and free you from this bloody franchise. Yep. But she wants to claim ownership of it at the same time saying she wants to forget it. Not not buying it. So into the the idea of pay when it comes to voice actors. You know, one of the interesting experiences that me and Donnie had at Southern Fright Gaming Expo was listening to uh, Tim Kitsaro talk about kind of just this. Uh, do you remember that, Donnie? I do. Yeah. And one of the things he talked about was that I think he got paid, what, like 700 bucks to do all the voices for NBA Jam? It was very, very small. Right. And so I get the desire to get paid more for a game that's going to make millions of dollars. Let's be honest, right? Mm -hmm. I totally get that. The other part, though, the differences in between what she's saying versus what Platinum Games is saying, there is some huge hole in the story that I don't think we're aware of. We got big holes. We got small holes. (laughs) Mobius for all of them. Yeah. (laughs) And I don't think it's crazy to ask for the amount of money that that platinum suggests that she asks for if you know if they feel as though that investment is worth their time but that's what happens when you negotiate right right yes you get one side you you make a a decision as to to what a good value is for the both of you and you come decide that that's going to work there's a lot of similarities between this and freelance writing. Right. It's like you can always stand your ground. You can say, I am worth more. I'm not going to take this amount of money. This is insulting. But there's always somebody willing to do it for cheaper. Always. And while you may be talented, you're always replaceable. Always replaceable. Always. And I don't think that she realized that. I think that she made the, like, I want to make $100,000 doing I this. Mean, yeah, that's a huge, if you're right. offering a counter negotiation to $15,000, if that's what truly went down, which is, of course, because of non-disclosures, we'll never truly know right. who's telling the closer version of the truth. But to go from 15000 to six figures plus residuals, that's nuts. Right, right. It's like the guy who goes up to this gold and silver pawn shop on Pawn Stars. It was like, you know, I've got this this coin that... You're you're telling me it's worth three dollars, and I want, you know, ten thousand dollars for this. Right, and they laugh you out of the store. <laughs> right, right. They go, we're we're a little too apart here. <laughs> yeah. To yeah. Make a deal. <laughs> so the idea that voice actors should be paid more should be able to um, receive a bigger cut of these games that, like you said, are going to go on and make millions and millions of dollars. I think that's a legitimate thing that that video game fans should push for. Mm -hmm. But however, let's make sure we do it in the right way. Let's make sure we do it in a way that lifts up voice actors, but not at the expense of developers and people, other people working at different roles in the video game industry. Because if this game fails, that's that's going to be a huge blow for Platinum Games. It's going to be on them. So shouldn't their developers also be getting this major windfall of money for, for bringing the characters to life or bringing the game to life? Right. She's a very small part of it. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. You know, your average developer probably isn't making $100,000 to, no. to do this game. No. So. And if she's she's doing a number of four-hour sessions and then you add together the number of hours that she would have put into the game versus somebody who has worked and probably been through crunch and done all this stuff to put together this game, knowing that Bayonetta fans have been rapidly asking for Bayonetta 3 for years because the last right. one was in 2014. So it's been a while. Knowing you have to get this right or the fans will be disappointed and then to have your work just kind of brushed to the side is insignificant because a voice actor called on the fans to boycott. I mean, right. that, that's that got to be a low blow. I'm not getting what I want, so guys, don't buy this game. Nyeh. That's what that sounds like. Right. And as somebody who's been working 20-hour days, six days a week is going, really? Right. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, screw yeah. you. <laughs> so... Yeah, I think there's a lot of aspects of video game production that could be improved. And as video game fans, I think that we can push for those kinds of things in constructive ways that don't involve becoming part of a Twitter mob and attacking some other voice actor just because she happened to be offered a role and took it. Because who wouldn't? I would take it. 
Absolutely. If they said that I have the voice to bring this character to life. <laughs> Hang on, Donnie. I'm going to look up a, a bayonetta line and you can read it for us. Oh, oh okay. yes. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> I was hoping. So look in the Zencaster chat. If you need to learn how to talk to a lady, <laughs> ask your mum. <laughs> oh, my uh, God. Thank you, Mr. Griggs. I think we'll be going in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call us. We'll call you. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let, me, let me try this again. So give, me, give me one more shot. Give me one more shot. Mr. Griggs, we have other people to audition. If you need to learn how to talk to a lady, ask your mum. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? Oh my God, you just started a terrible trend where AI is now going to do all voiceovers. <laughs> I mean, Troy Baker wanted that to happen. That's Come on. true. That is true. Oh, Troy. <laughs> Before we move on, let's take a quick break to talk about our sponsor. This segment is probably sponsored by The Leaders Podcast. It's a show where three friends and occasional guests play games about video games, including trivia, game show games, and more. Here's this week's trivia question. With the latest announcement of the Silent Hill franchise, let's go back in time a bit to the first Silent Hill, which used quite a few references from other tangentially related media. Harry Mason's daughter, Cheryl, for example, was named after a real-life Cheryl, an actress who played a significant role on a 90s TV show. Name that show. Tune into the Leaders Podcast this Wednesday to hear the answer. You can find the Leaders on your favorite podcast platform. and We'll also have links in the show notes. I got nothing. I'm interested to know the answer, though. I'm not on the up and up on a lot of Cheryl's in the world. So <laughs> yeah, I'm rocking my brain for every Cheryl I know. And uh, I don't know many. I don't know either. I, I didn't ask him. So. Come on. Oh, oh man. <laughs> I guess you'll have to listen. I guess we'll have to listen to the next episode. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming, students. Please take your seats. Welcome back to Professor Rybred's Gaming History 101. And in today's lesson, we're going to talk about the first 64-bit system to hit the marketplace, which really was two 32-bit processors that a lot of developers used to make 16-bit games. I'm, of course, talking about the last foray of the once king of the video game industry, the Atari Jaguar. 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 <laughs> So let's kind of start back in the beginning. I want you to think back to the late 1980s in the video game industry. Nintendo had taken over the market with their NES slash Famicom home consoles, and Sega had just come out with the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive, 16-bit system that was poised to take a huge bite out of Nintendo. Somewhere off in the distance was the once leader of the video game industry, Atari, and their 7800 home console and XEGS computer console hybrid, barely registering a splash in the marketplace. With the XGES and 7800 still utilizing 8-bit technology, it was clear if Atari ever wanted to achieve its former glory, they were going to have to invest in an advanced system for the next generation of hardware. So realizing that Atari just didn't have the internal talent to develop such a console, they reached out to the UK-based Flare technology to design their system of the future. Flare was a new company that was created by three engineers, Ben Cheese, that's his real name, Ben Cheese, <laughs> ben Cheese. <laughs> Martin Brennan, and John Matheson, who worked at Sinclair, known for their ZX Spectrum home computer. Flare was tasked with coming up with a new chip for the Atari prototype they named Panther, after one of the developer's wife's car, a Panther Callista. This eventually went on to become the name of Atari's prototype 32-bit system. Now, you may be asking yourself, wait, isn't this about the Jaguar? And you'd be right to ask that question, because have you ever heard of an Atari Panther? Have you? No, I have not. <laughs> well, there is a good reason for that. It never came out. Ah. The, de <laughs> the development plan for Atari was to release the Panther in 1991 to compete with the Super Nintendo and Genesis Mega Drive, eventually releasing a more advanced 64-bit console later on to continue the technological advantage it would have in the marketplace. However, as you can guess, it did not work out that way. Now, Atari was a bit impatient, 
and began to develop the 64-bit console even before they had finished the development for the Panther. Engineered by Flare Technologies as well, Atari's president and son of Jack Trammell, Sam Trammell, decided to stick with the theme of big cat named cars going with the Jaguar for the 64-bit system. Now, due to some of the problems with the dev kit for the Panther and the fact that the Jaguar's development was actually ahead of schedule, Atari decided to pivot their plan and just release the Jaguar instead. So rather than releasing a Panther in 1991, Atari focused on releasing the Jaguar in late 1993. At the time, marketing for the Super Nintendo Genesis and even the TurboGrafx-16 slash PC engine focused heavily on the idea of marketing their console's number of bits. Cluing in on this fact, Atari developed an aggressive marketing plan called Do the Math, where they talked about the Jaguar was the future of gaming because it had more bits. Do you guys remember that commercial? Yes, it was the teacher, the lady with the yep. bob haircut and the redhead, and she's up there like sixteen plus whatever plus this and this. And the guys are like, "Huh?" She keeps repeating it over and over and over again. Some of you believe your system is the most advanced in the universe. Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is sixteen bits. Three DO is thirty two bits. The Atari Jaguar is sixty four bits. Which is more advanced, Clifford? Hmm. 16 and 32 are less than 64. So with 64 bits, 3D graphics, real-world animation, and lightning speed that you can only get with Jaguar, which is more advanced! Can you repeat the question? Jaguar! 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 Now, despite many gamers being unaware of what bits actually do for a system, it created a buzz in the gaming community preceding its release. This attracted game developers for the system with the likes of Virgin, Interplay, Ubisoft, and Activision showing interest in making games for the Jaguar. Now, Atari did something unique with their first rollout. They basically did a pilot to see if the game system was going to be attractive and a hit. So Atari conducted a soft release for the system for the Christmas season that year, producing 50,000 consoles to be sold in New York City and San Francisco. The campaign was a roaring success, with many stores selling out on day one. Now, this led to 2.5 million pre-orders placed in the European market. But due to supply shortages, Atari couldn't possibly ship that many consoles to Europe. So they need to decide which market to focus on, the U.S. or Europe. Despite Atari being extremely popular and a relevant company in the Euro- for European gamers, Sam Trammell made the choice to go with the U.S. market as their focus and only initially shipped 2,000 units to the U.K. Wah, wah. It's a little less than 2.5 million. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine doing a pre-order and then like, yeah, it's never going to come out. Talk about your all-time backfires. Right. (laughs) So once the Jaguar was officially released, it came with the packing game Cybermorph. Where did you learn to fly? Where did you learn to fly? Which was an open 3D world shooter that received lots of positive reviews. But when it came to follow up games for the system, developers found it difficult to program for. Now, the system, rather than having one 64 bit processor like the Nintendo 64 did, It used two 32-bit processors, nicknamed Tom and Jerry, one acting as a graphical processing unit, or GPU, and the other as a sound card. Having to program for two processors was not attractive to most developers. One other problem was that the system also had a 16-bit processor that was intended to be used as an input device, taking instructions from the controller and relaying it to the other two processors. But several developers instead just programmed games for the 16-bit processor and therefore made games that look like they belonged on older consoles. <laughs> <laughs> and now the 64 stuff. Let's, let's, make, let's make Super Nintendo games and put it on there. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff just isn't working. Let's stick with what we know. Yep. Now, not to say that the Atari Jaguar didn't have some impressive games. It did, including titles such as Tempest 2000, Ports of Doom, and Wolfenstein 3D. And its most popular game, Alien vs. Predator, which, Donnie, you've played before? Is that right? I, I have. It was a long time ago. A friend of mine actually had an Atari Jaguar. Why? I have no idea. But that was the one and only game that they had. And it, was, it wasn't it was bad. It's essentially Doom with aliens, right? Pretty much. Yeah. 
Now, sadly, due to its limited library, the Jaguar never saw the critical mass in sales it was looking for, only selling 100,000 units out of the projected 500,000 in its first year. In 1995, with the release of the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation, the Jaguar couldn't keep up. One month after its release of the CD add-on, the Atari decided to stop investing in the Jaguar's future, eventually leading to the Tremels selling the company in 1996. That was a quick downfall. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is where the fun comes. This wasn't the end of the usefulness of the Atari Jaguar, though. Eventually, the mold for its shell was sold to a dental imaging company Mm -hmm. that used it to make cameras for dental office, even using the game cart molds for optional memory expansion. Ouch. So... It looked exactly the same as an Atari Jaguar, but it was white. And the cartridges were white, too. So it literally looked like a Jaguar on your uh, sitting next to you. It just so happened to have a wand that had a, a camera on it as well. Can you imagine sitting in your dentist chair, like going in there and all of a sudden they swing something over? You're like, I, I, yeah, I got a car. like, what? We have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I, I, woo! You know what's funny, too, is that the shell itself wasn't just used for an imaging company in the late 90s. Uh, The shell was also used for the failed crowdfunded Coleco Chameleon system. Yeah. And what's funny is uh, this past weekend at PRGE, I saw a very unique looking Atari Jaguar, which was clear. It, it It was a clear case where you could see all the components inside. And I posted that on Twitter and I was like, when was the last time that you saw a clear Atari Jaguar? And people were chiming in, oh, and this was the Coleco Chameleon and all it was was a capture card inside. Which I think the one that you saw was a legitimate Jaguar. It, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yep. It was it was a 100% Atari Jaguar. The, the inside of the board, you could even see it's Atari, Atari, Atari. It wasn't a Coleco. Gotcha. The unfortunate part is that it did see the same fate as our friend Tommy <laughs> Tellerico's in Television Amiga. <laughs> <laughs> our friend Tommy. Oh. Uh, sadly, it seems that the shell would co- would continue to spread its bad luck even into the future. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So to kind of summarize, the Jaguar was a truly ambitious system that attempted to push the technology of the video game industry forward. Unfortunately, due to poor planning and a lack of games for the system, it would never achieve the level of adoption to make it a true competitor. Pour one out for the Atari Jaguar. Or maybe the the takeaway here is stop naming your consoles after animals. <laughs> <laughs> or cats. Cats. Well, Specifically big cats. <laughs> That's true. Right? Animals, a chameleon, yeah. Mm-hmm. The Amico's not an animal, though, right? No, <laughs> not naming your console after an animal is not a guarantee of success. So there it is. <laughs> so thank you for attending today's lesson. Big thank you to Wrestling for Gaming on YouTube for some of today's information. Just as a reminder, if you have ideas for stories you'd like to hear, send us a message at gamersweekpodcast at gmail.com, and we might feature your suggestion. All right. So why don't we go ahead and wrap things up for tonight? Thank you for listening to episode 44 of Gamers Week podcast and a big thank you to the Retro Game Club podcast, the Leaders podcast and Love Retro BTW for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to check out their links in the show notes. If you want to connect with Gamers Week, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Email us at Gamers Week podcast at gmail.com. Visit our merch store at chambers-week-podcasts.creator-spring.com or if you want to do it the easy way, follow the links in the show notes. Join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamersweek. And finally, since you made it all the way to the end of the episode, please leave us a rating and a review to let us know how we did. We really value your feedback. While you're there, consider subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. Does anybody else get anxiety whenever they have to read the gamers-week-podcast.creator or the, the visit our merch store? No, but I like how Ryan emphasized store instead of merch. <laughs> it was a it was merch. a celebratory. A merch uh, store. Merch store, yo. <laughs> and I got I said merch correctly, so the store yes, was did. a little bit emphasized. Just let the northeastern accent out. Just let it out. <laughs> Maxa! <laughs> Gotta go play some Mario later. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.
Jaguar. 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 Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut, patrons with benefits. This is the unscripted patron-only bonus cast with less editing and more dirty jokes. We don't know where the conversation will go, but we're sure it will be weird. This fish just went right on my nipple. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I Google Street Fighter 6. The first search result that comes up is people think they can see Ryu's dick in the Street Fighter 6 reveal. <laughs> Listen up here, kids. You're not going to want to get one of those VD STDs things, right? Make it fall off. When you go, grab a pro. You'll be doing it for America. That was perfect. <laughs> if you want to hear weekly episodes of our patron-only bonus cast, join us at patreon.com slash gamersweek.